we're going to talk about earth tubes. So lots of uh, myth busting today, uh, lots about earth. So we call it tales from the underground. And we're going to reveal some data on earth tube performance. So there's a controversy around earth tubes. And we're going to cover what that is. Then we're going to talk about some earth tube basics, give some examples of earth tubes in North America. Uh, Rob is going to explain the design and criteria for an earth tube. And we're going to present the results from uh, Walton Passive House, which is a passive house designed by Mr. Blakeney. And we've analyzed minute by minute data uh, from it for the last year and a half, which is like millions and millions of data points, uh, crazy spreadsheets. And then we're going to finish up with what experts say. So uh, the controversy is as follows. This crowd is a very knowledgeable, unorthodox crowd. And everybody, like, nobody builds passive house. Nobody builds sustainable. But this crowd does. But when I ask people about EarthTube, I hear, like, concerns. I hear skepticism. And I don't hear a lot of excitement, similar to uh, rammed earth buildings. And I'm not sure why that is, but people usually quote mold and unproven performance and earth tubes seem to cool or heat whenever you don't need it to cool or heat. And some people say that it's got thermal memory. It accumulates basic accumulates temperature and the second year it acts, you know, not it's not as efficient and the third year is not as efficient and then the performance just deteriorates. So we're gonna see and some other people say it's just limitless energy, it's free, it's passive. It's either cheap or free, and it's forever. And it's usually portrayed as a do-it-yourself, oh, I got a spelling mistake. It's a do-it-yourself uh, thing that any hippie can do. Well, let's, let, let's see what, where the truth is. So if you look online, there's not a lot of information. Uh, there's one article on uh, Green Building Advisor by, by Malcolm Isaacs who says it's absurdly simple and cheap source of limitless energy. That's a powerful statement. And then, and there's like 100 comments and like 89 of them are negative. And then you go on the Green Building Advisor again and there's two more articles all about earth tubes and uh, do earth tubes uh, make any sense? And again, there's a couple of people who comment saying, oh, I got an earth tube, it works great, it has been working great for 10 years. And there's like 90 more comments saying, yeah, we don't believe it. Uh, and those people have not necessarily had an earth tube or designed an earth tube, but they have an opinion. So many of those people point to this uh, CMHC study. It's a 60 pages document from uh, 2012, which says many things. And one of those things is performance of earth tubes in Can uh, Canada's climate has not been demonstrated. And therefore, you need to exercise caution, exercise caution and carefully considerate before you engage in installing an earth tube. What's an earth tube, if you don't know what that is? Uh, this uh, highly technical drawing shows what that is. Basically, it, it's a tube in, in the earth. Uh, you know, the cold air, let's say it's winter outside, the, the cold air comes in through some sort of a filter. You want some sort of a filter to filter out like dust, pollen, and insects, and raccoons. And then the cold air goes in and then warms because the, the, war, the, the earth is warmer here and it's colder here. And then it goes to your ventilation system. There may be some heat exchange there. And then it goes into your house, and uh, it's kind of free and limitless. Oh, uh, and it, it, it sometimes is drained, either like if you have a ravine or something, or berm, it, go, it goes to the daylight. And if you don't, it can have like a sump, or you can drain it to your house and have like a drainage uh, something. Uh, so here are some examples on top of what Rob's going to share. Um, Jason Rosco, uh, that's a very typical project, two pipes bottom at like Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever they have in, in the US, uh, buried about five to six feet deep, uh, they're 100 feet long, connected to his Ultimate Air ERV. And uh, it cost him $1,700. And he included his own labor in there, priced at 350 for like four hours or something. And the results are plus 16 degrees Celsius preheat in the winter and minus 11, pretty cool. And he was operating only one earth tube out of the two. And you can read all about it in his presentation right here. Also check out his blog and, and his website. Uh, this is a, an example from Jim R. Dales. This is from, uh, from Quebec, Montreal, on two projects. Um, four inch pipes, 100 feet uh, long, 
buried about seven to eight uh, feet deep, spaced apart. You can see the trench is very wide. It's a very different design. It's also corrugated pipe, but it's lined on the inside, so it's smooth on the inside. It cost them $6,000. Mostly because of the excavation and the nice decorative stack, which is $1,500. He also say, says, I, I have a secret. I'm going to share it with you. You can share it if you'd like. And the secret is UV light. So when the, when the pipes come into the house and at the junction, he installs a UV light like in a plenum box to you know, fight potential mold. He says he thinks it's an overkill, but nice to be safe. Again, the results, uh, plus 20 degrees Celsius. You can check up uh, his website as well. This is Malcolm Isaac's house. He's got a great blog. On the next page, I'm going to show it. So he's, his example is unique. His pipes, he's got three pipes converging into one spot. They only bury two feet deep. So they're not very deep. And uh, not to damage them, uh, during backfill, he put some uh, concrete blocks. This is his house. You can probably imagine that there's bedrock very close here. That, that explains the, the depth. The funny thing, he gets up to 30 degrees Celsius preheat. And it cost him $600, and he enjoyed the labor which he did himself. It's $600. And the funny thing about this project is, he shared his story, and on Green Building Advisor, people comment saying, oh, we don't believe you, you're getting plus 30 C, and it's only two feet deep, and it's only, what, 90 feet long, so 30 feet each pipe. And he's saying, well, you can believe whatever you want, but this is a fact. And people don't believe him. And here are some pictures. Uh, also runs, the pipes run next to a septic tank, which also helps. You can see they're coming up here. Check out Malcolm Isaacs. This is an interesting design. This is corrugated pipe. It's wavy. There are two layers of three pipes. So there's actually six pipes, three and three. And they're in gravel and in cloth. And so it's a total of 780 feet of length. And to, they're not sloped. So it's a very unconventional design. They're not sloped, but they're, they're slit lengthwise. So it's moisture drains right away. This is a design by Larry Larson, who's uh, reportedly installed about a couple dozen of those in Iowa. And they all seem to work properly, even though some people think they, they shouldn't. The cost is about $6,000 again, most excavation and, and fill. And the results you can see here. Uh, the owner, Bob, I did not, I could, that's one person I could not talk to. Jason Morosco tried to contact him. He's been friends for years. Five years after the installation, uh, Jason talked to him and he was fine, no mold and all that. And he also did an inspection after two floods with a camera, looked inside the pipes, after like two major floods, when the pipes were like flooded, no mold, everything's fine. There's some more examples right here in Toronto. We've got uh, Reiner Hoer. He's not here tonight. Uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about his projects because you know him. Most of you know him. You can ask him. Uh, his pipe was also flooded once, but he's still operational for like, what, 10 years? This is a funny example. It's, it's in Vermont. Um, it's... They got a blog about raising pigs, uh, but they still <laughs> installed an earth tube, and it operates incredibly. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to tell you about the design, because Rob said it, it sounds like a miracle. It defies laws of nature. Engineer and me will not support that. So I said, I'm not going to talk about it, Rob. And, and there is, I also talked to one esteemed consultant who preferred to stay incognito, and he claims to have installed 47 earth tubes, and they all work. And I asked him, could you please share some best practices? He said, not a problem, $1,600 an hour. I said, I can see you're an esteemed consultant. <clears throat> There's also some commercial installations. Um, some, this is in my backyard. Uh, this, my house backs onto this UFT uh, and Earth Rangers. There's multiple commercial installations. We're not going to cover that because we're mostly focused on uh, residential. And at this point, I'm going to transfer to Mr. Rob. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so some of you may have heard about uh, this house, uh, the Walton Passive House. Uh, Chris Lee uh, is the um, 
the owner, uh, Chris and Judy Lee. Uh, it is uh, located in Huron County, and it, it's, it's pretty close to Passive House. We didn't certify. Uh, this is the, uh, the first earth tube that I worked on. The second one is actually just down the road from here. It's at 366 Huron uh, for the University of Toronto. They have, uh, we're putting in infill house and two laneway houses. This is uh, student, uh, student or, or professor housing. And uh, those three houses will be fed from one earth tube. And the opportunity there was that they were taking a house out that had a basement. And I said, I, I want that basement. And we threw the earth tube in. And uh, that should be up and running um, in hopefully early summer. Uh, so we're just going to talk about the Walton Passive House. So, first of all, we've been collecting data for the last year and a half. Uh, we have a conditioning ERV there by uh, Build Equinox. It's called the Serve, and it has built-in uh, mo uh, monitoring software, uh, uh, monitoring that actually gets uploaded to um, to Build Equinox in Iowa, and uh, and also that I can actually check on my phone. So. We've I've got a number of these now in various houses and passive houses. Very useful piece of equipment. It's uh, a heat pump uh, ERV. So instead of having a core, uh, it, it uses a heat pump to transfer heat back and forth. What I like about the monitoring is that we just do not get proper monitoring of our houses, passive houses. So this gives me the chance to actually do that. And now I can share the information. Uh, of course, it, it takes information uh, readings every 60 seconds. And you can imagine a year and a half of 60 seconds is an enormous amount of information. And we can't really uh, cut that down because what's happening in that unit is that it's switching back and forth between fresh air mode, recirculation mode, it's shutting off, it's doing all kinds of different things, electric heater coming on, things like that. So we have to know at each discrete point what it's doing and then use that to calculate the appropriate uh, energy or energy savings in this case. We matched it, or I should say we, it's a uh, URI, matched this with weather data. Because the one mistake that uh, we did make, or one of some, uh, is, is that uh, we didn't measure the actual temperature coming into the earth tube. So we have the temperature at the serve, at the back end of the earth tube, but not the front. And so we had to use local climate data to match. And that, that, was, a, that was a fun exercise. Anyway, ended up with this, um, this spreadsheet uh, from Hell. Uh, what did you say? How many points? Like millions, millions. Okay. And, and just to make things worse, um, when I first got the spreadsheet from Yuri, it was in Russian. Uh, so, yeah, we've had some fun with this. So, just going to go through some of the things that we looked for, um, the opportunities for savings in an earth tube. You get latent energy savings. Um, because what, what happens in an earth tube is that uh, it's, it's air heating a cold environment and so you will get uh, condensation and that provides, uh, that, that takes out latent energy in that, in that air. Um, dehumidification, uh, that's the same thing and uh, so what we did is we compared the moisture, the relative humidity in the air using the uh, Environment Canada data and also we measured that at the serve and we were able to track water as it was going through through the earth tube. We also have, uh, we temper the supply as uh, Yuri mentioned in the winter we are preheating the air coming into the house in the winter we are pre-cooling it and so there's the sensible uh, heat transfer that happens in the earth tube. We also have uh, an increased overall coefficient of performance Coefficient performance is, the, is basically the, the heat in divided by the energy used. If we, if we temper the air coming to the heat pump, then we're able to actually increase the heat capacity of the heat pump and also increase the overall COP. And uh, okay, so on this project, because the serve uh, wasn't able to meet, uh, on, on modeling wasn't able to meet uh, the heat on the coldest day, we had to have a post heater coil, electric coil, a, ha a hair dryer basically. And so we were, uh, the earth tube was there to try to minimize the need for that uh, electric coil. And we looked at that. So an earth tube works because at certain depths below the ground, you, uh, you, uh, you decouple yourself from the air temperature. As you go deeper, it's more constant. 
And uh, these curves re represent here, uh, the blue is the air temperature, and then you see the variant various depths of earth tube, and as you go deeper, the line flattens out. Now this is, this is the data from the Walton House. And as you can see, in the winter, we've got lower temperatures, both winters. We actually ended up in, uh, we've got a year and a half, so we have over a year of data. And then in the summer, we've got the higher temperatures. The, uh, the green is the outdoor temperature, and you can see that it varies quite uh, a lot more, and the earth tube stays relatively constant, and it's also flatter. Once we drill in, you can see a little bit better what's happening in January and in, all in July. So in January, you can see that the orange line is consistently above the green, the green line, which is outdoor air. And the opposite occurs, a little harder to see in July, but the averages, we can see that it's up to, up to 25 de uh, degrees Celsius uh, difference in temperature. And, th oh, sorry, and 31 degrees in January. So in other words, we're adding 31 degrees Celsius to the air coming into the house. If we look at it on averages, because things are spiking all over the place, we've got average in uh, January, uh, outdoor air temperature average at 4.4 degrees Celsius, and the average earth tube temperature was 13.5 degrees Celsius. So an average uh, delta T of 13.5. In July, the band looks a lot closer. Um, we, we have an average air through temperature of 17 degrees and 3.2 deg degrees Celsius. So even though the delta T is smaller, this actually represents uh, a larger energy savings because what's happening is that that earth, temperature, that earth tube temperature never gets above 17 degrees. So in the summer, it's providing a whole lot of free cooling. Basically, 17 degrees would be perfect. And uh, of course, it's dehumidified as well. So it's very good. Uh, just takes you down below that, uh, that threshold. So uh, what we found here is in, uh, in July that the compressor for the, uh, for, the e, uh, for the ERV never came on. So it was all in free cooling for all of July. And that's, um, that's free cooling just using the earth tube temperatures. And um, we had up to 6,000 BTU per hour of free cooling. What it also meant was that uh, with the earth tube is smart enough to actually measure what's coming in and say, OK, we, um, we don't need to turn on the, 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 the air temperature is, is good enough. We don't need to turn on the compressor, blah, blah, blah. And just, push that into the house. Well, what ended up happening is it's just using fresh air to cool the, air, to cool the, the house, and therefore you get 40% additional ventilation through the summer. And that's, that's getting more and more important, of course, as we, as we start to learn about pandemics and things like that and, 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 and unhealthy houses. We need to get more fresh air is the number one, reason, uh, the number one best way to, um, to increase the uh, livability of a house. Uh, there we have the maximum delta T's, just because we had the data, we could find it. Preheat 28.1 degrees. It was able to preheat that air before it came into the, uh, into the house on January 20th. And pre-cool, uh, it dropped 15.6 degrees. So this is pretty significant. Uh, potential negative effects. Okay, so uh, this particular design, and, and you know, for the, for the next one, I think we would do it slightly different, is that we didn't have a bypass. On the second one, I have a bypass. So everything that goes into the house has to come through the earth tube. There are times of the year where the um, outside air, for instance, in April, and we might be uh, looking to put some heat into the house in April, but uh, the, um, the outdoor air is actually warmer than what's in the earth tube. But we, we're only connected to the earth tube, and therefore we have to take that air. But because we're using a compressor, a heat pump, to, uh, to make up the difference, it really ends up being a very small amount of energy. This is the unit, the serve. Uh, it, it, it's actually a very small uh, compressor on that thing, and that's why it needed help. So that's why I use the earth tube. It works very well with a compressor. One thing I will say is 
doesn't work quite so well with an ERV or an HRV because what an earth tube does is actually change the delta T and the delta T gives you the efficiency on an earth tube. Uh, or, sorry, on, a, on, a, on an ERV. So um, it doesn't quite work as well as it does with a heat pump. That one. Does it pay off? Do you want to talk about that or should I? Uh, I, think we're, I think they want us to... We're done. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Well, uh, let me conclude. We're going to skip that slide. It does pay off. Indoor air quality is monitored real time and it's great. Uh, oh. Oh. So, here's a myth. It's somewhat busted. So here's what experts say. I've talked to all of these people for like at least 30 minutes each. And these are people who've actually had experience and lived in homes with earth tubes. And the funny thing is, they all say yes. When I ask them, I ask them all the same question, would you do it again? And they all said yes, except for the incognito guy. He said yes, unless you're an idiot. But everybody said yes. And like somebody quoted Adam Cohen saying, oh, Adam Cohen said that uh, earth tubes are, you know, can create mold. I talked to him today. He was so excited about earth tubes. He said, earth tubes are great. They're great for a climate. He's installed some back when he was a cowboy and he's learned some mistakes and he said, earth tubes are great. So, and even Anarchan is catching up and they're saying it can provide significantly, well, significant contribution to your heating and cooling. So when you design the next building next time, please consider an earth tube. Thank you. <laughs>